So uh, thanks everyone for uh, logging in. So uh, today it's going to be Dr. Michelle Brown. So she's going to talk about catalyst 3D printing and supports for electrochemical water splitting in alkaline media. So I uh, met Michelle when she was a PhD student in Trinity originally uh, with uh, Professor Mike Lyons. And uh, she's gone on a big adventure since uh, off to Czech Republic. So really looking forward to hearing what she did there. So um, Michelle, over to you. And uh, thanks for uh, coming on our seminar today. Much for the introduction, Michal. So yeah, as Michal said, uh, my name is Michelle Brown and I'm Mary Sorosco Curie Individual Fellow at Trinity College Dublin. Um, currently, um, I am under the mentorship of Professor Valerian Nicolosi. And today my talk is going to be about everything I've done previous to this position. So my talk today is called Catalyst 3D Printing Supports for Electrochemical Water Splitting and Alkaline Media. So just for some of those who don't know me, I did my PhD in Trinity College Dublin under Professor Mike Lyons and Professor Co Paula Colavita um, in the area of electrochemical water splitting and alkaline media. So when I finished this position, um, I undertook a very short postdoc again with Paula um, in Trinity College Dublin. So this essentially, essentially allowed me to complete my um, electrochemical water splitting studies um, at a synchrotron. Um, which let us probe some of the materials that we looked at during my PhD. Then I moved on to uh, be a research fellow at Queen's University Belfast under the mentorship of Professor Andrew Mills and this was on a UK catalysis hub project. So I went away from traditional electrochemical water splitting into photoelectrochemical water splitting with Andrew. Then afterwards I became a ChemDesh research fellow uh, under Professor Martin Pomera um, at the University of Chemistry and Technology in Prague. And here I um, developed uh, 3D printing techniques for electrochemical water splitting and other electrochemical processes as well. But for this talk, I'm just gonna talk about some of the 3D uh, printing that we did for water splitting. Then also during my time with Martin, uh, we received an RSC or Royal Society of Chemistry uh, Mobility Grant. Um, to work with Professor Dan Brett at University College London. And this allowed us to look into um, essentially the differences between the evaluation of OER catalysts in a conventional tree electrode cell uh, compared to an actual um, electrolyzer, which was very interesting. So currently, as I've already said, I'm a Mary Shirosko Curie Individual Fellow under Professor Valeria Nicolosi at Trinity College Dublin. And for this fellowship, I am looking into 2D and lyric materials for uh, water splitting, uh, fuel cells and supercapacitors. So the outline of my talk today is uh, some motivation of why I do electrochemical water splitting, uh, the introduction to electrochemical water splitting. And then the talk will be divided into three different sections. So the first section is my catalysis work in Trinity College Dublin. Then I will go into my 3D printing work uh, from Prague and then I will have a few slides on some common misconceptions um, that I can tell from some literature papers. And also from this sparked some of the work that I did in Queen's University Bel Belfast, which was to develop some supports for OER. So just some motivation on my work. So every year, essentially, um, there is a key World Energy Statistics document, which is published by the International Energy Agency. So this document will tell us every year how much energy that we are consuming. So in 2020, which is obviously this year, um, this document told us that in 2018, the amount of energy that we consumed um, through fossil, uh, fossil fuels and um, through renewable energies uh, was approximately 9.9 mTO. So this is a massive amount of energy. And just so people can realize how massive this energy is, is this energy is equal to approximately um, the energy released by burning 700 million barrels of crude oil. So this is an exceptional amount of energy. So first of all, most of this energy is that the 9.9 mTO, most of the energy is from fossil fuels, burning of fossil fuels. So the fossil fuel um, reserves that we currently have are gonna be depleted in the next century or so. And then also if this wasn't enough reason to um, go into or look at uh, renewable energies. We also have the burning of these fossil fuels can release nasty greenhouse gases that will have detrimental effects on our environment essentially. So what we have to do is look into um, different alternative clean routes to make um, 
energy. So one of these energy routes that I look into is called the hydrogen economy concept. So I think our, most electrochemists will know this concept. It was coined by Professor John Bockris in the 1970s. And essentially what this concept tells us is how hydrogen can be used as an energy carrier. So the hydrogen in this concept here um, shows the production, storage, distribution and utilization of hydrogen. So if you look at, sorry, I think I can get my pointer. Yeah. So if we look at the hydrogen econ economy concept here, we have renewable energies, which can create essentially power, which can then be put into an electrolyzer. So the electrolyzer can then make hydrogen. The hydrogen can be then stored for future use or used directly in a fuel cell. So the fuel cell can then be located um, at a house or the fuel cell can also be in a car. So essentially for this concept, there's different points where electrochemists can work on, but I'm working on the electrolyzer part, so making the hydrogen. So in this talk today, I'm going to talk about two different um, kind of concepts of water electrolysis. One is traditional water electrolysis, which you can see from source one here. So essentially you use electricity uh, to power an electrolyzer. And then source two is photoelectrochemical water splitting, which is where we can incorporate photocatalysts or photo photoelectrocatalysts into uh, an electrode and shine a light. And this will also promote water electrolysis. So just some fundamentals about water electrolysis. So this whole talk is going to be alkaline water electrolysis. So essentially we decided, or during my PhD, it kind of was decided for me. The reason we wanted to work in alkaline is because the materials that we use are all based on transition metal oxides. And if we use acidic media, they will corrode. So in alkaline was the optimum electrolyte for water electrolysis. So essentially what water electrolysis is, is the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen. So on the cathode, you will have your hydrogen being um, evolved, and this is called your hydrogen evolution reaction. And then your anode, you will have your oxygen evolution reaction where you have your oxygen being evolved. So if you can see here, these are the two reactions for the OER and the HER, but the overall cell potential of water splitting um, is a combination of these two reactions, which is these two parameters here. So this is the over potential for the HER and the over potential for the OER, then also plus the thermodynamic potential, which is 1.23 volts versus ORHE, and then also any other ohmic losses which we have in our cells which could be to do with, say, electrolyte losses. However, the oxygen evolution reaction is the bottleneck of this reaction. So this is why I predominantly work in the oxygen evolution reaction, because if we can make this reaction more efficient, we can make overall water electrolysis more efficient, producing more hydrogen, which is more then cheaper for the economy. So currently, uh, for water uh, splitting and alkaline media in this three electrode cells that we have in our labs, iridium oxide and ruthenium oxide are the best OER catalysts. So some people will say that it is nickel and iron, which I do agree if it's the actual electrolyzers, but in the small scale cells that we use in our labs, I still believe it's these two very expensive materials. So the reason that these materials are the best for the OER is because they produce oxygen at the lowest known over potential at a current density of 10 milliamps. So they're very efficient. So current density of 10 milliamps um, is essentially the benchmark current density that everyone uses in OER to evaluate their catalysts. Um, and then the cons of these materials is that they're very expensive because they're less abundant than most of the other first row transition metals. So this brings me on to essentially my PhD work, which was to develop efficient, stable and cheap electrocatalysts for OER using transition metal oxides. So the reason that we pick transition metal oxides, sorry, I'm just trying to move, this might mute me. Yeah, okay, sorry, just trying to move it. Yeah, perfect. So essentially why we picked uh, transition metal oxides is because they have multiple oxidation states available. So they're very tunable materials for the OER and the oxidation state of an OER catalyst is extremely important. So manganese, I picked manganese. Uh, for the material that I wanted to look at for my PhD. And this is because it was a cheap material. If you look at it compared to say, one kilogram of the precursor metal cells for ruthenium and iridium, it's very cheap compared to it. Um, 
manganese is also has a very important role in photosystem two, which is one of the where it is actually the best water splitting catalyst uh, known to man. Um, it's also the least studied out of the manganese, iron, nickel and cobalt when I started my PhD. And then also there is a lot of room for improvement for the over potentials for this material as the lowest over potentials for manganese when I started my PhD uh, for OER at a current density of 10 milliamps was, was about 500 to 600 millivolts. Um, and then the highest being about 750 millivolts. So there was a lot of room for improvement here. So what we actually decided to do was mix the manganese with ruthenium. So to see if we could get a stable active catalyst um, that was quite efficient. So essentially what we wanted to do here was try and dilute the, the ruthenium with manganese. So even if we got 1% of manganese into the ruthenium and we could decrease the cost but keep the activity, we would class this as um, a win essentially. So before we went and made any of our materials, we went and did a literature research, uh, which everyone does when they start their uh, new work. So first of all, uh, we went and looked at two papers by Fernandez et al. and then also by Yavagan et al. So these two papers were quite interesting for us because we learned that mixed manganese and ruthenium oxides can actually be better OER catalysts in both acidic and alkaline media than their pure counterparts, so manganese oxide and ruthenium oxides. Then by looking at another paper by Ewan et al. in nanoletters, we were able to see that by using a lower manganese oxidation state when uh, mixed in with the ruthenium, we could get an improved OER activity, which you can see here by comparing the previous two um, papers. So with the previous two papers, Fernandez et al. and Givagan et al. use MnO2, which is an oxidation state of four, and they actually, none of their materials actually reached a current density of 10 milliamps, but for the lower oxidation state of MnO2 when mixed in with ruthenium, you see that we get um, an over potential of 500 millivolts at a current density of 10 milliamps in alkaline media. So for our work for ruthenium and manganese materials, what we wanted to do was see if we could even lower the um, oxidation state of the manganese when mixed in with ruthenium to see if we could get better OER results. So before um, we went off to make our materials, we looked at some TGA studies and essentially uh, one, one manganese salt called manganese acetate, when you use um, low annealing temperatures, you can get um, lower manganese oxidation states of MN304. So this was the basis for the making of these manganese ruthenium materials. So the synthesis was as follows. So essentially, we wanted to look at different ratios of manganese with ruthenium. So we um, picked seven different ratios of manganese and ruthenium. So from the list here, when I talk about something that is say 90% manganese, that means the material has 90% manganese and 10% ruthenium. So we made seven different stock solutions containing the different ratios of the manganese and ruthenium salts and butanol. Um, the seven different stock solutions are all sonicated separately at 15 minutes. And then to make the actual OER catalyst or OER electrodes, we got um, titanium wire, which was encapsulated in glass. And then we painted on the different um, solutions onto the tip. So say here um, of the electrodes. So the seven different electrodes with the seven different ratios were then baked in the oven at 350 degrees. This process was then repeated with fresh electrodes and um, the electrodes were then baked again at 450 degrees for nine hours. So for this study, for the overall study, we had 14 electrocatalysts for, um, to look at our OER. So, so for this study, I'm not going to give um, loads of materials characterization. I'm just gonna show some SEM and then I'm gonna go straight to the summary of the OER and then explain from there why we think some catalysts are better than the others using and um, say XBS and XRD. So just quickly, um, again, because there's so many catalysts in this study, I'm just going to refer to um, subsets uh, when I want to make particular points. So for the annealing temperature 350 degrees, uh, I'm going to show the pure manganese, which you can see here, the SEMs, we have this lovely leaf-like morphology. And then for the ruthenium 100, we have this crack-like morphology. So this crack-like morphology is very indicative of very active ruthenium dioxide for OER. 
And then for our mixed samples, we also have this cracked like morphology. So we were quite excited when we seen this because we were hoping that we would get improved OER activity, the same as say Fernandez et al did too. And um, so just a summary of our catalysts. So before I just go into the summary of my catalysts, I just want to point out that in the green line um, on the graph, this is the manganese and ruthenium mixed catalysts that I was talking about by UNET al. And then in the yellow line here, um, this is a commercial ruthenium dioxide, um, the OER activity of it at 10 milliamps. Um, and this was from a paper by Jaramillo et al. So these are the two different references here if anybody wants to go and look at them. So first of all, I'm just gonna say that the precursor manganese is on the x-axis and then the over potential for our 10 milliamps is on the y-axis. So first of all, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our manganese 100 catalysts. So at an leaving temperature of 350 degrees, um, the manganese 100 outperforms their chem to part at um, 450 degrees. So from the graph here, um, essentially why there is no bar chart for the 450 degrees MN100 catalysts is because it didn't even reach a current density of 10 milliamps in the potential window for the OER that we um, used. So to try and figure out why this manganese 100 is the better catalyst, then it's uh, the 350 is better than uh, the manganese at 450. We looked at some XRD. So first of all, the structure was quite similar. And um, the XRD revealed that we had MN304 for the two different materials at 350 and 450 degrees. Uh, MN304 is quite a special catalyst uh, or material because it has a spinel structure. So essentially what it is made up of is a manganese three um, oxide, which has which is um, octahedral sites, and MN two oxide, which has tetrahedral sites, and these two sites are in a ratio of two to one. So what we wanted to do, because some of the X or D reflections were slightly different, was to look at um, XPS to see what ratios um, of the MN two and MN three that we had. So by comparing the XPS. Um, of the MN100 at 350 degrees and the MN100 at 450 degrees, we were able to show that um, the ratio of the MN2 and MN3 in the 350 degrees was truer to the spinel structure. And this is perhaps why we get better OER activity for the MN100 at 350 degrees. So essentially, um, we were able to say from here that for the pure catalyst, we did make a lower oxidation state of manganese. Then I'm going to move on to the 100 ruthenium or the MN0, um, which you can see here. So again, the 350 catalysts outperformed its counterpart of 450 degrees, which is the same trend as the MN100. So again, to figure out why. Oh, and also just to point out that these two MN100 catalysts outperformed the commercial ruthenium um, in the exact same electrolyte. So to try and understand why the ruthenium 100 was better at 350 than 450 degrees, again, we looked at some XRD. The XRD fashion at 350 degrees and 450 degrees both showed that we had a rutile ruthenium dioxide structure. Um, however, again, similar to the manganese 100, we had slight variations um, in the XRD reflections. Again, we turned to XPS to try and figure out why our 350 catalysts was better than our 450 catalysts and essentially what we figured out from XRD is that we have an increase of ruthenium metal at 450 degrees. So in literature, in, it, ruthenium dioxide catalysts are normally better than ruthenium metal catalysts for the OER. So essentially this is why our 350 degrees catalyst was better than the 450 degrees. However, this is kind of an unusual result as our annealing was done in oxygen. So it's very weird or strange that we got increasing ruthenium metal content at a higher um, annealing temperature. And the reason we think this happened is because the carbon residues from our butanol could be acting as a reducing agent to our ruthenium dioxide, which makes the ruthenium metal increase. So we also had another paper published in Chem Electrochem, um, which carries on from this study. And we, at the same, for the same ruthenium 100 catalyst at 600 degrees, uh, when it was baked in air, we also had it more of an increase in ruthenium metal. So essentially, 
we have direct carbon residues are causing uh, the ruthenium metal to increase, which causes the OER catalyst to decrease also. So this is why our 350 catalyst was the superior catalyst for the ruthenium dioxides or the MN zeros. So now just to look at the summary of the mixed catalysts, um, which is very interesting. So I want to point out two points here. So the first point is that the, for the mixed catalysts, the catalysts at 350 degrees um, mostly outperformed their counterparts at 450 degrees, except for the manganese uh, 25 here. But in the overall conclusion, essentially we have our optimum catalyst is the manganese 10 at 350 degrees. And one other conclusion that we can draw from comparing this study to the previous studies done in the literature for the manganese and ruthenium mixed catalysts is that the lower MN oxidation states actually do, uh, when mixed in with the manganese and ruthenium, does promote um, better OER catalysis. So then I said previously that during my first research um, fellow position with Paula Colavita, we went to a synchrotron um, and then we probed the OER, uh, some of our OER catalysts uh, using X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy, which essentially can provide a wealth of information on the electron structure of a targeted atom. So the atom um, in this slide that we targeted was the MN edge. We also targeted the ruthenium edge, but currently we're still trying to interpret some of this data. So I just want to give you um, a quick snapshot of what we think is happening for our mixed catalysts. So this is just the manganese um, mixed catalyst at 350 degrees essentially that we're looking at. So if you use um, X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy, and you also have reference materials, so commercial materials that you know the oxidation states of, you can plot these edges when you probe them with the X-ray near edge structure and um, spectroscopy. Um, and then you can plot the edge positions of the materials that you made, and you can essentially get out their formal oxidation states. So this is what we did for our materials. So this is essentially the different spectra for the different materials. And here we can plot the edge position against manganese oxidation state. And in the gold boxes are the reference materials. And then the dots are our different materials that we can then plot the edge position. And then um, we can then know or determine the manganese oxidation state. So we did this before and after OER. So this was ex situ work. Um, and two of the um, conclusions that we got from this work was that the higher oxidation state uh, values for the MN um, oxides for our mixed materials um, obviously showed better OER um, activity for the MN10. And then also for the MN10, it was quite interesting that the oxidation state, the difference between the oxidation state before and after the OER um, didn't really change that much when compared to the other materials. So it showed that this material was very structurally stable. So also to do structural stability is obviously a very important point for OER catalysis, but also um, the effect of the morphology we also thought played a role um, in the enhancement of the MN material uh, for the OER. So essentially there was a paper published by Mayhofer and co-workers uh, where they looked at ruthenium dioxides with different morphologies for the OER, so a cracked morphology and then non-cracked morphologies. And what Mayhofer et al. Um, proposed was that there's faster nucleation and detachment of um, oxygen in the valleys, which you can see here of my diagram that I made. Um, so essentially, we have this cracked morphology for the MN10 as well. So there is a combination of factors that can influence the OER. So we think that our MN material is the best material in our study because of the morphology that it exhibits and also because of its structural stability. Um, so the take home messages that I want to give for my OER catalysis work, because it was quite a short um, section, I'm not going to give uh, main conclusions on my work, but instead what I'm going to do is kind of give overall conclusions and um, to try and help people in OER catalysis. So I just wanted to say that like finding an OER catalyst that can outperform the current state of the art is like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, so don't get um, too bogged down if you can't find one initially when you say if you start your PhD or your postdoc. And um, I think the most important thing is to understand why um, materials behave as OER catalysts the way they do. 
and that uh, in situ and operandi work is imperative to try and figure this out. I also personally think that um, single element catalysts have been exhausted um, for OER catalysis at this, at this time. And essentially, I think that any catalyst that will outperform the current state of the art um, OER catalyst is going to be a material that is a buy or try element catalyst. So they will play off synergistic effects between each other. So for this work, I just want to thank Professor Mike Lyons and Professor Paula Colavita and Trinity College Dublin. Um, I also want to thank uh, Richard, Orley and Ian. Um, they were all in my group uh, during my time in Trinity College. Also uh, Emiliano for his help with Synchrotron in France and then Hugo and Georg for their um, help in the materials characterization of the manganese and ruthenium catalysts. So then that's the end of that section. So the next section is essentially going to be on my 3D printing work um, that I have done in Prague. So recently, there has been an explosion of papers uh, utilizing 3D printing for the fabrication of electrodes for electrochemical energy applications. Um, but when you make an electrode uh, using 3D printing for electrochemical applications, the process is essentially the same. So first of all, if we just look at this diagram here, you will design your electrode in a CAD um, software, which is computer-aided design software. And then you will 3D print your electrode. And then for electrochemistry or electrochemical applications, we normally need to modify the surface to make it better for the reaction at hand. So then just to go into a little deeper into this um, design process, just going to look at this circular diagram here. So there's a few different types of 3D printing. Uh, which can be used for electrochemical energy applications. Um, there is direct ink writing, which is normally used for supercapacitors and battery work. And then there is um, SLA, which is select, which is serial lithography, um, which uses resins, which can be used for battery supercapacitor work as well. But in the area of electrochemical water splitting, um, the two different 3D printing techniques that are normally used is fused deposition modeling and selective laser melting. So fused deposition modeling, I'm going to talk about first, um, and it's going to be the predominant uh, 3D printing technique that I talk about in this talk. And then I'm going to show you one slide on the work that I've done for SLM, which is uh, 3D printing of metal electrodes. So fused deposition modeling essentially is um, where you use thermoplastics to print electrodes or any anything you want really. So for electrochemical applications, a fuse deposition, a fuse deposition modeling is very effective because novice can use it. Um, it's very simple to use and it's very cheap. You can get fuse deposition modeling printers for about 500 euro. So um, there has been an explosion pretty much in the literature of uh, different groups using a conductive graphene based PLA filaments called uh, black magic for various different applications. So this conductive uh, black magic filament is made of a PLA structure, which you can see here. So PLA is very insulating. So the amount of graphene that they actually put into this filament is only 8% graphene. So it is said to be electronically conductive, but it might not necessarily mean that it's uh, electrochemically conductive. So when you 3D print um, an electrode, say, from this material, this is the SEM images and the EDX that is resulting from that. And you can see from these um, SEM images especially that there's a lot of charging on the surface which is not good for electrochemistry because we need conductive electrodes for electrochemistry. So this is um, a problem that was um, shown uh, throughout um, some of the electrochemical papers in the literature for 3D printing. So there was different ways that different groups wanted to try and develop better catalysts using this 3D printing filament. So one group, Fu et al, in scientific reports, uh, electrode deposited gold essentially onto the 3D printed um, electrodes from this filament. And of course, they were able to increase um, supercapacitor uh, capabilities um, of the gold print of the gold electrode deposited electrode. However, this is quite um, only this is masking the problem, the insulating problem that they have with these electrodes. So during my time, just before actually, I went to Professor Martin Pomera's group. Uh, one of the other postdocs, Lorena, um, did a study and essentially what she did is she was trying to remove some of the PLA in the electrodes that were 3D printed. So by using DMF, um, Lorena immersed some of the 3D printed electrodes um, into DMF for different times. 
and using then for a, a very fair redox probe, which is used throughout the literature essentially um, to determine the electron transfer properties of many carbon-based materials, she was able to show that the electron transfer properties increased when you immerse the electrodes into DMF for approximately 10 minutes. So essentially the mechanism that was at play here was that the DMF was swelling the PLA, the PLA then fell out. So then we had more graphene or graphene-like material available on the surface of the electrodes, which increased the electron transfer. So when I came to the group, we decided that maybe what about trying to do some electrochemical activation um, on these materials, because electrochemical activation has worked um, in the past for carbon-based materials. And again, in uh, Ferry Ferro, you can see that um, when you apply different potentials, you can get different um, oxygen moieties on the surface of different carbon um, materials. And this will also improve the electron transfer properties of these materials. So this is what I tried to do. So first of all, the electrode uh, fabrication process was just using fused deposition modeling at um, different parameters. So we decided for this work to use a nozzle temperature of 220 degrees. Um, and these were the resulting electrodes from our printing process. So we were able to connect the electrodes essentially directly to the potentiostat by clipping the potentiostat cables on here. So first of all, we tried to do electrochemical treatment in PBS solution at uh, 2.5 volts versus AG AGCL for 150 seconds. So essentially, if we look here at our CVs from our very first cyanide redox probe, we can see that before activation, we the the uh, um, the electron transfer properties are very poor. And then after the electrochemical treatment, which we thought was going to work great, um, it turned out it did not work at all. So this is very poor um, electron transfer properties again. And perhaps what was at play here was that there was poor electronic pathway from the surface to the bulk of the electrode. Then, um, essentially, when I was in the lab, I was thinking that maybe I was doing something wrong. So I then decided to go and repeat Lorena's work. Um, so I repeated Lorena's work. Um, I immersed the electrodes in DMF for 10 minutes. And then afterwards, again, we looked at the electron transfer and we can see that we have um, some peaks here for the Ferry Ferro uh, redox probe. So essentially we have an increase in our electron transfer and this is obviously because of less PLA. So electrochemical treatment didn't do anything because essentially the PLA was blocking the um, electron pathways. So then following on from this, what we did and said was we DMF treated first and then did some electrochemical treatment. And so you can see here from the red CV, we actually had the best electron transfer properties in this study. So just to go into a little bit of why we picked the time and the potentials that we did is that we also did a lot of um, electron transfer studies uh, for time. So essentially what we have here is electrode activation time on the x-axis and then peak separation of the um, fairy ferro peaks um, on the y-axis. So you can see here we have almost like a Goldilocks region um, which and shows us that the best time for the electrochemical treatment is at 150 seconds. So essentially if it's too less we mightn't have um, as much oxygen moieties on the surface as we want for electron transfer. And then afterwards, we might have too many electron, uh, sorry, um, oxygen moieties, which will cause the very ferro uh, redox couple to also repel from the surface. And then following on, we also did potential studies. So essentially the potential studies plateaued at about 2.5 um, volts versus AG, AGCL here on the x-axis and again, peak potential on the y-axis. So it plateaued, so we decided to use 2.5. I also didn't want to apply um, any larger potential in aqueous solution um, with potential sat for the um, electrochemical treatment. And it probably wouldn't have made much of a difference anyway. So that was the rationale uh, for picking the time and potentials for electrochemical treatments for this study. So then as this talk is all based on water splitting, um, we also conducted hydrogen evolution um, studies for our, uh, for different materials. So essentially we get the same trend uh, for the HGR as we do for electron transfer cities. Um, and for the DMF and DMF electrochemical um, materials, there is about 80 millivolts in the difference. But when you look at between no treatment and then the DMF and electrochemically treated, there is approximately 600 millivolts difference. So we wanted to kind of understand why a little bit more. 
So for this, we went and looked at some morphology and elemental studies using SEM and EDX. So essentially what we have here on this graph is uh, the 3D printed uh, materials, which is before activation. Um, and then so for each step, essentially, the SEM and the EDX are below the different routes for here. So route one is electrochemical, and then you have the electrochemical SEM and EDX. So just before activation, which I've already showed before, we can see that there's a lot of charging and it's hard to image due to the, a large amount of the PLA at the surface. And then the rest of the SEM images for the materials for electrochemical DMF and DMF and electrochemical show that it resembles um, a network of wires essentially. But then when you go from electrochemical DMF and DMF and electrochemical, you get um, a better a network of wires and less of these um, node-like materials, which you can see all along here, especially in the EDX, you can see the node materials. Um, and then for the EDX, um, I just want to point out that the pixels in the blue are the oxygen moieties, and then the pixels in the red are the carbon moieties. And essentially what we get is an increase in the carbon from when you go from electrochemical to DMF to DMF and electrochemical, which tells us that we have a very carbon rich um, surface for our DMF and electrochemical materials. So also we wanted to look into the um, actual carbon, carbon oxygen species on the electrode surface. So for this, we looked at some XPS. Um, also on this graph, I have a Nyquist plot, which I'm going to talk about in conjunction with the XPS, because I think it goes very well and it gives the overall study of why um, our materials are better, some materials are better for HGR than others. So before activation, um, all of the high, these are all high res XPS core levels, and they're all in the C1S region. So this C1S region for the before activation um, shows an uh, indicative um, plot for PLA, but then also with an increased SP2 peak due to the increased uh, graphene which was put into the 8% graphene that was put into the material during fabrication. Then for the electrochemical only, um, we can see that we have um, defects on the surface, oxygen defects that are being introduced. Now, when you look at the before activation and the electrochemical um, only activated electrodes, and you look at the Nyquist plot for it, you can see that for the four different electrodes in this study, for the before activation and electrochemical only, they have more resistive behavior than the DMF and DMF electrochemically treated. And this is because uh, for the DMF only, we can see that there is a decrease in the carbonyl peak here when compared to the before activation. And this essentially is telling us that we have a decrease in our PLA, which can also be seen by the decrease in the resistive behavior um, in our Nyquist plot. And again, you see the same um, Nyquist plot but, um, EIS behavior for the DMF and electrochemical treatment, but our C1S region is quite different um, compared to the DMF only. And this is because XPS actually only probes the first two to five to 10 nanometers um, of our surfaces. So essentially for a DMF and electrochemically activated material, we essentially have a functionalized graphene material. And this is why we think it is slightly better for the HUR when compared to our DMF materials. And then obviously the DMF electrode is better than the electrochemical only and before activation uh, due to the PLA being removed. So as an electrochemist, um, we always want to try and improve, I suppose, on the materials that we have for different reactions. So essentially what we wanted to try and do was use the DMF treated electrode um, and then electro deposit that uh, to, to see if we can get um, some good OER performances for these materials. So we went from HGR and now we're going to OER. So in another study in ChemCom, um, we 3D printed um, again the same materials. We did our DMF treatment and then we electro deposited um, nickel oxide onto our electrodes by a multi-cycling regime. So essentially we can see the increase um, in our current density over potential uh, to our multi-cycling in a nickel bath, which is, which is essentially telling us that we are getting more nickel on the surface of our electrodes. So then to prove this, uh, we use some XPS as well. So essentially we have before um, nickel oxide 
uh, NI2 peak peak here, which has absolutely no, no showing no peaks. Mm -hmm. And then after the NI oxides electrode deposition, we have these two peaks here, which are very indicative of uh, nickel species on the electrode as we are in the nickel 2P region. So this shows us that we have some form of nickel on here. So I normally do fit my XPS, but this was kind of a tough one to fit. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. So essentially, just for a quick recap for those who don't know about the redox properties of uh, nickel oxide, which I'm, I suppose most people do. And um, so this is a graph taken from a paper from Doyle and Lines et al. in PCCP, which shows a nickel deposition on a glassy carbon substrate. So what essentially we have here for oxidative sweep, we have the nickel two to nickel three uh, redox transformation. And then we have a smaller little peak uh, which can also be to do with the nickel tree transition. And then further on, you'll have your OER. Then on the backward scan or the reduction scan, you will get the peak, you will have your redox transition for your nickel tree to nickel two. So this is indicative or typical properties of a nickel oxide electrode on a carbon-based material. So the this is what our redox properties look like uh, when our DMF electrode was electrode deposited with nickel oxide. So essentially what we have here is no nickel two to nickel three redox species. And we can also see that there is an a huge increase in the OER, but we have the nickel three to nickel two um, redox transformation. So also during my PhD, I did a lot of work on nickel oxides, nickel iron oxides. So essentially this CV that we got for our DMF modified 3D print electrode with nickel, was essentially typical of a nickel iron oxide electrode. So what we done was we wanted to investigate then if there was any impurities in the actual um, filaments of our electrodes. So we used some XPS again. So from XPS, um, we looked at the, because the readers, because of the CV looked like a nickel iron CV, we wanted to probe the Fe2P region for the XPS to see if we had any um, iron peaks. So for the filament, we actually got no iron peaks at all. So we were kind of a little bit puzzled. Then for the actual 3D printed electrode, again, no iron peaks. But for the DMF treated electrode, we could see that we now have iron peaks. So essentially, we thought that the iron could be embedded into the graphene and the, it was only able to be determined by XVS when there was a reduce in PLA in the electrodes. Um, so, and then we also looked at titanium and we could also see again for DMF treated, we had some titanium peaks as well here. So essentially um, the HDR activity for our actual electrodes could be due to these impurities and not actually due to the carbon moieties on our surface. So just quickly, just to finish off this 3D printing um, part, um, I just want to show what you can do with metal 3D printing. So very quickly, uh, in another paper in Advanced Energy Materials, uh, when I was with Martin, we showed that you can 3D print um, stainless steel electrodes using um, selective laser melting. And then you can modify this stainless steel electrodes because stainless steel isn't a great OER catalyst. Um, and then you can modify with different uh, materials that you wanted. So for this actual study, we wanted to modify the surface with TiO2 because we wanted to look into photoelectrochemical water splitting. So what we did was uh, we did different um, layer growths on the surface. So we wanted to try and customize our electrodes. So from XRD, uh, we if we, I just show you from XRD, we did uh, three different cycles um, of atomic layer deposition of our TiO2 onto our stainless steel electrode. So for the 400 cycles, 800 cycles and 1200 cycles, you can see that this reflection here, which is the 101 a reflection of TiO2 will get um, smaller as we increase in cycles. And essentially what this is telling us is that we're getting a more crystalline TiO2 on our surface as our film thickness increases. So to get the actual film thickness of our uh, TiO materials, we use um, ellipsometry. And then we then use these materials for photoelectrochemical water oxidation catalysts, as you can see here. And the best material was the uh, 1,200 cycles of TiO2. And this was obviously due to the material being more crystalline because this will stop a uh, recombination of your um, 
your high, your H plus and your E minus uh, coming back together uh, during water splitting. And then just to look at some stability. So instead, uh, we in the paper we do actually look at stability during water splitting, but because uh, photoreactive chemical water splitting or just traditional water splitting um, can be intermittent source of um, energy. We looked at the difference between the CVs of our TiO2 uh, when we first made them and then after four months in storage. So the bare um, stainless steel can be seen in the black and then the two blue, um, the cyan and then the dark blue are the, the, the best electrode essentially when it was first made fresh and then four months later. So it doesn't really lose any activity. So these materials are very stable as well. So then this is the end of my 3D printing part of the talk. Um, so some of the take home messages for people who want to go into 3D printing for electrochemical water splitting is essentially commercial thermoplastic filaments are not an ideal precursor for electrodes for electrochemical reactions uh, due to the impurities that are in them, which I've showed. So I would recommend to make your own homemade filaments by extrusion. Um, I think there is a paper by Robert Dreif in advanced materials where they make their own materials, which is um, a good paper to look at if you want a starting place. And then finally, the combination of SLM, which is uh, metal 3D printing, and ALD, atomic layer deposition, is an exciting avenue to explore to make custom electrodes for all various types of electrochemical applications, not just water splitting. Um, there was a paper by Martin uh, recently with Veronica that showed that you can use 3D printing um, for not using ALD, but you can use 3D printing for um, detection of uranium recently this week. So finally, I just want to thank Martin Pomera and Professor Zenik Sofer for um, all their help when I was in Prague. Oh, the, the work on the metal 3D printing got a um, cover in advanced energy materials, and then the impurities work actually got a cover in ChemCom as well. I also want to thank um, everyone who helped me on this work. Um, yeah, Prague was a very nice time. So then the final part of my talk, which I will go through quite quickly, um, I say I'll only be five minutes on this. So I just want to discuss some common misconceptions in some of the setups used for OER and alkaline media. Um, and then from that, I just want to kind of give hints or tips of what uh, counter electrodes to use, working electrodes to use and reference electrodes to use. And then also I'm just going to go and show um, a little bit of the work that we done in Queen's University Belfast about making um, different supports for the OER. So essentially, I just want to do a little bit of introduction here. So uh, counter electrodes. So this essentially here is a setup that people use um, in the lab for OER. So it's a tree, it's a conventional tree electrode cell with um, a counter electrode, working electrode and reference electrode. So counter electrodes, which are normally used for OER and HER in alkaline media, normally consists of say carbon rods and platinum wire. Um, a lot of people use platinum wire, um, especially for HDR, but I would recommend to use carbon rods instead because when you use uh, platinum wires for HDR, you can essentially the platinum will dissolve into solution and then redeposit onto working electrode, which can make your um, HDR catalyst seem better than it is. Um, for reference electrodes for the OER and HDR and alkaline media, um, you should only use mercuric, mercuric oxide. I always see um, a lot of papers, especially when I review as well, that people are using AG, AGCL um, electrodes for the OER. Um, and this is a big no-no, especially if you don't have a membrane because uh, the chlorine ions can seep into your electrolyte and the chlorine evolution reaction is a competitive reaction to the oxygen evolution reaction. So essentially the current that you're getting um, could be because of the chlorine evolution reaction, but you're not going to know, especially if you don't do selectivity um, experiments as well. So um, I would say that buy HGHGO electrodes. And then also for the HGHGACL and the SEE, you will cannot, they're also made of glass. So you can also have iron seeping into your electrolyte, which will again affect um, your OER or HGR materials. So if anybody actually wants any uh, references, to back up what I'm saying here, please feel free to email me and I will send you on the papers. 
So then finally, for working electrodes for the OER, I'm just going to talk about OER exclusively here. So a lot of people use glassy carbon. It's the most common type of working electrode. Um, some people use platinum, titanium, or nickel foam. So for working electrodes for the OER, um, the characteristics of ideal working electrode um, are obviously they need to be conductive. Um, if we're talking about OER, um, no redox peak in the OER region, uh, no OER activity, and the working electrodes should not degrade physically. So the, the glassy carbon electrodes that um, many people use, it will actually degrade at high um, oxygen or OER potentials. Um, it can physically pit as well, which then can give it a larger surface area. So then if you're reusing glassy carbon electrodes, your current density can also be higher due to the pitting, which will give you a larger surface area. So when, when I was in Queen's University Belfast, we wanted to try and look into um, using glassy carbon electrodes for the OER or using alternatives. So essentially, if you see this graph here, this is a graph from one of my papers um, in Queen's University Belfast. So what we did here is we deposited different uh, commercial materials actually from Sigma Aldridge. So ruthenium dioxide, cobalt oxides and nickel oxides onto glassy carbon and then a polarized or applied um, a current density of 10 milliamps for um, a long amount of time and we wanted to see the stability activity. So essentially here we can see that the nickel is very bad. Um, the cobalt and the ruthenium also lose their activity after um, about two hours or so which you can see by the increase in the over potential. So essentially what is happening here is that the materials, when you take them off the or, or DE um, setup, you can actually see that the materials are still on the electrode. So what in fact is happening here is that the materials aren't falling off. It's actually that the glassy carbon is passivating. So it is stopping the activity of the OER reaching the current collector or reaching the potential stash. So you will essentially then throw out what could be good materials for OER. Um, so to try and overcome this, when I was in Queen's University Belfast, um, we wanted to make an alternative working electrode to glassy carbon electrodes for the OVR. And um, so for this, we use an um, or or DE setup was this setup here, which you can see. And this was actually a very cool setup because we had these replaceable or or DE electrodes, which essentially you can just buy inserts and then put them into the or D the PTFE and then. Uh, put them, then screw them into your ORD setup. So we made um, different ORD electrodes, which you can see here in this picture, uh, mm -hmm. by using platinum powder. We pressed this by hand in an IOR, um, in an IOR uh, press, the IOR press. And then on top of that, then before we actually put um, massive amounts of tons, um, applied ton pressure to the actual electrode. We put our metal oxide on top and then some PTFE just to bind it, just a small little amount. And then essentially what we get here is our um, ORDE disc. So these are the discs here, um, and then they were inserted into our ORDE setup. So from the SEM images, we can see that they're perfectly circular. Um, you have your ruthenium on top or whatever um, metal oxide or OER or catalyst or whichever catalyst you may use um, on top. And then on the bottom, we still see platinum, but this is very normal for uh, working electrodes. Mm -hmm. So you just obviously have to remember to do a blank for your working electrodes. So what we picked up essentially from this study is that this increase in over potential that we see for our materials on the glassy carbon did not happen on the PT working electrodes, which again shows that there is a problem with the glassy carbon electrodes and also that um, our PT press uh, electrodes could be a solution for this, um, even though platinum is quite expensive. So because platinum is quite expensive, we, when I was in Belfast, we did another study on what is actually the best working electrode to use for the OER. So for this study, we used one material, uh, which was ruthenium dioxide. We made this oxide. It was a platinum, it was a, sorry, it was, a, well, it was a platinum, plat Adam's platinum catalyst is a very um, high surface area catalyst, but you can also make different other uh, materials of this Adam's catalyst, one being ruthenium dioxide. So we synthesized this material um, in Queens because we knew it was going to be a very good OER catalyst. And then we 
used our pressed PT electrode, which I just showed you in the previous slide, and then compared that to um, the same material drop cast onto PT, drop cast onto a TI disc, drop cast onto a glassy carbon disc, and then also um, sprayed onto a nickel foam, which is commonly used also in literature. So essentially, if you look at the CVs, the red CV is of the bare support, and then the black CV is of the support with the ruthenium dioxide. So as I said before, um, a good working electrode should not have any redox peaks um, in the area that you're interested in or have any OER activity. So essentially from this study, we actually ruled out that nickel foam should not be used uh, for OER, especially if you're looking at a new material and just wanna find out the OER activity of that material. So then carrying on in this study, uh, we used the press PT, the drop cap, the press PT with the ruthenium dioxide, then the PT, then uh, titanium, and the GC with the ruthenium dioxide. Um, we carried on further studies, essentially, um, the same studies for a stability test to see uh, what was the best working catalyst that we can use for the same material. So essentially, we get the same increase uh, for the glassy carbon as we did before. So we can rule out glassy carbon as a good um, OER working electrode. So essentially, we had three different working electrodes, which we can use which is the press PT that um, we came up with in Queen's University Belfast or developed in Queen's University Belfast, um, the normal PT discs and then the titanium discs. But if you're then talking about how to get the best bang for your book, essentially, um, with your research money, um, you will pick the, tit the titanium discs as you can get more titanium discs uh, for the same price of the PT, essentially. So from this study, um, I just want to say that you should be very careful if you're using glassy carbon electrodes for a working electrode for your OER and try and use alternatives if you can. I know they're the cheapest, but it's probably better to have reliable results. So just some take home messages for this section as well is just use the correct um, counter and reference electrodes when evaluating your OER catalyst and alkaline media. Uh, using the wrong electrodes will affect the results. Uh, be very careful when using glassy carbon um, and then other tips that I would give would be don't use a glass cell for alkaline media as uh, the iron can also seep into the electrolyte and affect your studies. And then try and use a rotating ring or a rotating disc electrode if you can, because the electrolyte will replenish at the surface of your um, catalyst each time, um, which kind of mimics um, an electrolyzer essentially, because the electrolyte is being driven to and then away from the catalyst surface. So just acknowledgements for this work is Professor Andrew Mills and Dr. Christopher O'Rourke in uh, Queen's University Belfast. And um, also then my overall acknowledgements is I would like to thank all the funding agencies that have funded me so far, and um, all of the institutes that have um, hosted me. And then I would like to thank um, the Mary Cree Actions uh, funding for my funding now. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, brilliant talk. Incredible combination of um, material science and electrochemistry. So one of the best uses of XPS and XRD I've seen definitely to explain exactly why your uh, certain working conditions are giving you electrocatalytic performance. So um, I'll open it up to the floor. Has anyone got any questions for Michelle?